War must be, while we defend our lives against a destroyer who would devour all. But I do not love the bright sword for its sharpness, nor the arrow for its swiftness, nor the warrior for his glory. I love only that which they defend. Greetings and well met, my friends. Yoisten here, and I hope you all are doing well, wherever you are in Middle-earth. Today, I wanted to try a new series that could help new and well-versed readers alike, as I have gotten a few requests to do Middle-earth geography videos. So today, we are going to look at the different lands and kingdoms of men in the Third Age under the sun in Tolkien's world, and see just where they are on the map. Without further ado, let's get into it. First, we will start with the lands of men in the northern and westernmost places of Middle-earth. The Ice Bay of Forukel was a cold and desolate land, and its location was approximately around the place where the Blue Mountains and the Iron Mountains met before the end of the First Age. It is speculated, but not wholly canon, in the Atlas of Middle-earth that Atumno was once located in or near Forukel. Again, that is just speculation, and I would argue that Atumno was actually further north and west of Forukel in its time. However, the everlasting cold climate was a legacy of Morgoth's lands. This land was always cold and snowy, as it was very far to the north and held the northern part of the Blue Mountains next to the frozen waters of the sea. During the Third Age, this land was home to the tribes of the Lossoth, or Snowmen, a people of fair and medium complexion that spoke the common speech and their own languages as well. These peoples were distant from those of the rest of the world, except for on certain occasions. Forukel and its people most notably appear in the tale of the Angmar War, when the chief tribe of the Lossoth sheltered the last king of Arthedain, Arvidui, for a time, and they were given the Ring of Barahir as a reward. The land and its people lived on into the Fourth Age. Next, we'll look at the lands of Arnor. This kingdom was most of the lands of Eriador, from the Loon River in the west to the Misty Mountains in the east, as well as holding the southern edge of Angmar in the north to the Grey Flood River in the south. However, Arigian, Rivendell, and other elven places were never a part of the Northern Kingdom. This land was full of green flatlands, hills, and mountains, with many forests and rivers as well. Like most Northern places, I imagine that the lands were temperate throughout most all of the year. Throughout the age, these lands were home to the descendants of Numenor and the Dúnedain of the North. Even after the fall of the kingdom to Angmar, the Dúnedain became rangers until King Elisar restored Arnor at the end of the Third Age. Other men that lived here were middlemen, and those of ordinary descent, such as most of the people who lived in the town of Bree. Some such folk would serve Saruman and play roles in capturing Bree and the Shire for Sharky. Hobbits, who were distant relatives of men, also lived in the Shire which once belonged to the North Kingdom. The folk of the North were fair of complexion, and they had dark hair, and predominantly spoke the common speech, while some rangers likely also knew Sindarin, and the Hobbits spoke Hobbitish. Some notable towns and cities within these lands are Anuminas, the former capital of Arnor, Fornost, the latter capital, and Bree, one of the last remaining towns of men in the north. Arnor and its folk appear in many stories relative to the events of the Third Age, such as the War with Angmar and the War of the Ring. Arnor would be re-established at the end of the age by Aragorn as a part of the reunited kingdom, while the Shire and its people remained autonomous, but friends of the north. As we move south and east, we come to Enedwaith and Dunland. These lands were filled with hills, mountains, and forests, as they were in the southern lands of Eriador, and they were just west of the southern Misty Mountains. These lands were likely moderate in temperature, if not a little cooler, as they were close to the mountains. These lands were inhabited by the wild men known as the Dunlandings, who were people of medium complexion, dark hair, and little cleanliness, as they seemed to represent barbarians to some degree. Alongside speaking Dunlandish, some of the inhabitants of these lands likely also spoke some common speech as well. Some stores, who were of the Hobbit kindred, lived in these lands too, and they likely had similar appearances to other natives of these places. Throughout the age, the Dunlandings likely waged war upon each other, while also waging war upon the Rohirrim, who settled the lands that once belonged to them. Most notably, this land and its people were mentioned in the Tales of the Rohirrim, especially in the Tale of Helm Hammerhand, and they were also mentioned in the War of the Ring, as many of the Dunlandings served Saruman in that time. Many of Saruman's brigands and ruffians that took part in the scurrying of the Shire are likely from these lands. 
After the Battle of Helm's Deep, it is likely that the Dunlendings would not again invade Rohan, but the Wild Men and their lands continued into the Fourth Age. Now we come to Rohan. These lands were once named Kalanathon, as they belonged to the Kingdom of Gondor. This area was the Vale in between the Misty Mountains to the north and the White Mountains in the south, while going west to the River Isen and east to the Anduin River. This land had vast amounts of green fields and hills, making horses an excellent mount within these lands. Some areas had their fair share of mountains or steep hills and cliffs as well, but they were few. Rohan was likely almost always warm and humid, as it was the central part of Middle-earth, full of grasslands. Before the coming of the Rohirrim in the later part of the Third Age, the Dunlendings settled these lands, even though Gondor had claim to them. After the Battle of the Field of Celebrant in 2510 of the Third Age, the Eothate of the North became the Rohirrim and settled in these lands. The Rohirrim were the descendants of the Middlemen, and they had fair complexions with blonde and red hair. They spoke both the common speech and Rohiric. The most notable strongholds of Rohan were Edoras and Helm's Deep. The tales concerning Rohan and its people are those found within the late Third Age, such as the tales of the kings of Rohan the wars with the Dunlendings, and the War of the Ring. Under Eomir King, Rohan and the Rohirrim survived, and prospered into the Fourth Age. Since we just talked about the Rohirrim, let's look at their next of kin. We'll start with the Kingdom of Rovanian before moving on to the Eothade, and their lands, and the Dale lands. The Kingdom of Rovanian was on the eastern side of Mirkwood, seeming to span from the Iron Hills in the north to the territories of Gondor in the Brownlands in the south. The kingdom also went west into parts of southern Mirkwood, and east to the lands of Dorwinian. These lands were likely full of plains, with some hills scattered throughout. The temperature was also likely average, as its location is in the central part of Middle-earth. The men of this kingdom were the ancestors of the Rohirrim and the men of Dale, so they were middlemen who had fair and medium complexions with blonde, red, and darker hair. They spoke early versions of Rohiric and Dalish and they likely also spoke some common speech as well. The Kingdom of Rovanian was good allies with Gondor, until the kingdom took on more and more hardships, gradually declining. Sauron returned to Dol Guldor in 2460 of the Third Age, and the land became gradually more dangerous until a new group of Easterlings came to finish off the kingdom once and for all. The most notable settlement of the Kingdom of Rovanian was Dorwinian, home to many gardens and known for its wines. The tales concerning this kingdom may be found in the stories about Gondor, King Eldakar, and the battles with the Easterlings. Concerning the Northmen who had gone on to new lands throughout the age, some folk were simple woodsmen who would settle near the Bjornings in the northwestern part of Rovanian, and they would likely survive and grow as a larger group of people, come the Fourth Age. Others would be the Eothade, who settled near to the north part of the Anduin, after the fall of Angmar. The Eothade would live in the cold, mountainous, and forested parts of the north, while finding small plains to settle in. They kept their fair complexions, with mostly blonde and red hair. The Eothade predominantly spoke Rohiric, but they could also speak the common speech. They would establish Framsburg and other settlements before leaving their lands for Rohan. Their descendants, called the Rohirrim, would survive into the Fourth Age. The last group of Northmen would establish the Kingdom of Dale, this kingdom held the valley in the shadow of the Lonely Mountain and near the Lone Lake. These lands were likely cold in temperature for a majority of the year, as they were in the north. The Dalemen were fair of complexion and dark of hair, and they spoke Dalish and the common speech. The notable settlements in these lands were Lake Town and Dale, and the most famous stories pertaining to these places may be found before and during the Battle of the Five Armies and the end of the War of the Ring. The Kingdom of Dale would survive the War of the Ring and continue into the Fourth Age. As we start to look at the last lands of men in the Third Age, we come to Gondor. The lands of the South Kingdom spanned from Belagar in the west to the Mountains of Shadow in the east, and from the White Mountains in the north to the mouths of the Anduin in the south. The lands of Gondor were warm, green grasslands with many rivers and shorelines. The settlers of these lands were mainly the Numenorians and their descendants, who were fair of complexion with dark hair and they spoke Sindarin and the common speech. The men of the mountain, who would eventually be known as the Oathbreakers, settled in the White Mountains. They were middlemen who were likely similar in appearance and kinship to Dunlendings, who spoke the common speech and likely their own language as well. 
There were also the Druidane, who settled in the Druidane Forest, in between Rohan and Gondor, and Druwaith Laur, to the west of Gondor. They were shorter than most people, with dark hair and red eyes, and they spoke the Druidane language. The notable settlements of these lands are Dol Amroth, Palargir, Minas Tirith, Osgiliath, and Minas Ithil, later known as Minas Morgul. All of the aforementioned settlers of Gondor played roles in the War of the Ring, and the other major tales concerning the Gondorians may be found in the histories of their peoples and lands throughout the Third Age and the end of the Second Age. Gondor would continue into the Fourth Age as a part of the reunited kingdom under King Elisar, while the Druidane and their lands remained free under the protection of Gondor. And of course, this all happened after the Oathbreakers were released from their curse. Now, let's move south and east into Horondor, Umbar, Near Harad, Harad, Far Harad, and Khand. These lands were hot, arid, and dry, especially those lands furthest away from the Sea of Belagar. Some lands were deserts, while Far Harad was home to some jungles where the Mummakil were found. The settlers of these lands were the Haradrim and the Varags, and they, along with the Easterlings from Rune, are descendants of those who had not journeyed to Beleriand with the Edain, and those who had served Morgoth and Sauron. Half-trolls lived in these lands as well. Also, the Black Numenorians, as they were called, were those from Numenor who served Sauron and became evil beings, and they also lived in these lands. The peoples of these lands had dark complexions and hair, and they may have spoken the common speech in addition to their own languages. The wildlife here is far different than that found in the rest of the world, as other places have similar animals to one another, such as elk, conies, boars, and others, but in these lands, oliphants live. These are massive, elephant-like creatures with six tusks that come from Far Harad and Khand. I'd imagine that other similarly different animals inhabit these lands as well. The stories that tell the most about these lands and their peoples are those about the wars with Gondor in the Third Age and the War of the Ring. These peoples and lands continued into the Fourth Age, but much of Harondor and Harad's western lands were conquered by Gondor. Lastly, we come to Rune. Little is known about these lands, but Rune was likely hot and dry for the most part, while the lands near the Red Mountains, the Sea of Rune, and the Sea of Helkar were likely cooler and more humid. Rune is attributed as the east and beyond of the Middle-earth that is depicted on the map. The inhabitants of these lands were the Easterlings and their tribes, and they were akin to the men of the south, as they were the descendants of those that did not journey west into Beleriand with the Edain and they fought as allies to both Dark Lords. They were medium of complexion and dark of hair, and they spoke a mannish language unknown to the Free Peoples. Horses must have also lived here, as some Easterlings known as the Wainriders and Belkoth built chariots drawn by horses in these lands. The notable settlements of Rune are the conquered lands of Dorwinian, as well as some other unknown places. And the most famous stories concerning Rune and its people are the stories about their wars with Gondor such as the Battle of the Field of Calibrant or the Wayne Rider War. These lands and their peoples continued on into the Fourth Age, but were subdued by Gondor. Eventually, the two factions made peace. From the lands and factions of men, we see how important places and people really are. The lands that we settle become home, and the people in it are kin, both of which are worth protecting. However, is it possible that we may one day see the world as a whole, and the people in it in such a way? Much conflict could have been prevented in the Legendarium if men saw it that way. At the end of the day, lands and factions are just parts of something larger that doesn't need so much division. Thank you all so much for watching and sticking with me as we talked about so many different peoples and their homes. If you enjoyed the start of this new series, please hit that like button and share this video with your friends. Let me know your thoughts about the lands of men in the comments below, and let me know what your favorite land is and why. If you'd like to contact me more directly, please join us on Facebook and Twitter, and if you'd like to support the channel even more, please consider donating to us on Patreon. Just one dollar a month will unlock the monthly podcast, and the second episode is already up. Links for those are in the description. Don't forget to subscribe to join the Men of the West and all of the Free Peoples today, and I will see you all next week with a video about the tale of the children of Hurun. Everyone, as always, thank you all so much for joining me on this adventure. Until the next one, my friends.